so I am going to talk today about scars upon my heart and um, women's voices from World War One. So I'm just going to launch straight into it. Although actually, before I do that, I'd really like to know how many people here have taught scars upon my heart. One, two, three, three and a half. Okay, that's good. Um, fine. You might know everything that I'm going to say, so, <laughs> so you can relax. All right, so just um, some general points about the volume itself, which I've got here. It's edited by Catherine Riley, we know that, and it's based on her absolutely groundbreaking bibliography work. She is a bibliographer, really, um, on English poetry of the First World War. And um, no scholar can work on the First World War without consulting that bibliography because it's an extraordinary piece. So when she was doing that, she, of course, discovered that there were over 2,000 war poets um, and a quarter of them, more than a quarter of them, were actually women. And she said, well, why don't we, we don't see them. Nobody reads them. What happened to them? Whereas a fifth of them are soldier poets. So the soldier poets are fewer in number than the women poets of the period. But So her work with Scars Upon My Heart was simply to put some of this material that she discovered, rediscovered, back into the public domain. And I think that uh, is reflected in the fact that it's published by Virago in 1981, um, and it is itself a document in Anglo-American feminism of the 1970s and, and the 1980s. So in a sense, I think this book has a double history. So it's a document in the canon reformation uh, that Virago was engaged in, in recovering, rediscovering texts uh, by forgotten women. And it is also um, a, a text in its own right as having a lot of content that we need to know about. So I think it's got this double appeal. The title, the subtitle, is of course Women's Poetry and Verse of the First World War. And the fact that she hasn't called it just poetry of the First World War obviously indicates uh, an ambivalence about the status that she herself, Riley herself, as editor, didn't feel she could just label this all poetry because she's making an aesthetic judgment, judgments about quality, and she is anxious not to oversell her material, I think. So she's all the things which we now might think of as being nursery rhyme or free association or, you know, verse which has now a recognisable aesthetic form. Um, sh she was less, less confident about calling it poetry. And obviously the thing that's in the resource pack is Lorna Sage's first review and she it is put by, no doubt, by the Guardian editor under the title Blighty and Anity. So they picked the most um, trivialising, diminishing line in order to uh, get people hooked into it. So it's a sad, in a way, that's a sad entry into, but it also shows how necessary the material is. So thinking about, the, the if you like, the double history of this book, I <coughs> when teaching it, I do think it's really important to look at all its parts and not just to look at the poems, but to look at the acknowledgements uh, and search out where the poems have come from, um, look at the biographies of the women uh, that are very, very brief, and now they can be supplemented by the Dictionary of National Biography, or there's a woman called Lucy London who's publishing online quite an interesting website. I think we'll put that on the Teacher Hub website. She's publishing online... Um, uh, uh, bit by bit information about women poets of the First World War and um, she's actually found out quite a lot more about people. For example, Nora Bomford, of whom we apparently know she's only a pantheist because she, that's what she called her book of poems, but actually um, Lucy London's found out quite a lot more about her and it's on her website, so it can be supplemented with other information. So I would just say that I think that's a really useful way into thinking about the volume itself, but of course it doesn't address the content particularly. Um, I think anthologies bring their, with them a real, uh, a, a real problem about how you teach anthologies because you, get, you, you don't have any of the uh, 
um, integrity of an aesthetic collection that's been put together by a single author. You get a vast introduction to the theme or the period, and it's the theme or the period that then provides the coherence to the subject matter rather than the biography of a single author. And I think that's particularly challenging, and I think it's particularly challenging when we don't know anything about most of these writers. They are still, most of them, foreign names to us. We're not familiar with most of them. Um, so I do think anthologies are particularly problematic, and this is even more problematic than most because of the unknown nature. So how do we approach it? Well, um, I just want to think about the sorts of barriers and breakthroughs, the barriers of we don't know anything about women poets, we don't want to know anything about women poets, or do we, um, that this collection actually achieves. So the title, so to think a little bit about Vera Britton, who is the most obvious, best known context for it, her um, Testament of Youth had been published by Virago in 1978, having been out of print since 1933. Um, so they, Virago was responsible for bringing that back. Within a year, it was serialised on the television, and it just took off from there. So that's how we know, really, about Vera Britton, and she became, obviously, supplied the most obvious title for this volume. Um, and in her poem, from which the title is taken, To My Brother in Memory of July the 1st, 1916, so the first day of the Battle of the Somme, um, which he survived, uh, only to die four days after she actually wrote this poem. She asserts with the title phrase that there is no difference. There is an absolute intimate connection between those at home and those at the front line. Um, and so one of the breakthroughs, I think, that the volume achieves is in asserting that intimate connection, the interpenetration of home and battle. There's an ambiguity about to what extent does this volume perpetuate stereotypes, ghettoize or ghettoize women's writing and women, and to what extent does it break those um, barriers down? Of course, in giving voice to the previously voiceless or allowing us to hear previously unheard writers, it breaks down a barrier. It breaks down the barriers between combatant and non-combatant, between men and women. But it also upholds them because it does suggest a separate sphere for women's writing and a separate sphere for men's writing. So I just wanted to end this little section on, on, on a more positive note uh, about the kind of breakthrough that took... You know, took place through the very, very dramatic changes in civilian life um, during, during the course of the war. So the who made this year all, mice, um, is, is a sort of a slogan from a section of Vera Britton's uh, Testament of Youth, where she writes uh, about, she's documenting her experience as a student in Oxford. She was at Somerville in 1915, and she, there were so few students that she was moved into... Oriel, all the women students were moved into Oriel, but there was a war between the male students who were still in Oriel and the female students from Somerville. There was a literal physical war between them and they weren't allowed to occupy the same space. And overnight, the male students made a hole in the wall and then put this sign on it that said, Who made this ear old? Mice. So this was, they were breaking down the barriers. And the, the dons, the female dons from Somerville, were so appalled that they literally guarded the hole. They sat next to this hole in the wall for or every night that they needed to stay there until it had been rebuilt. And I just thought this image of policing the possible breakdown, you know, by the matrons of, of um, senior educational leaders, uh, I thought this was very funny, whereas the young people were just determined to actually break through the barriers and to be working together. So, we are looking at a time when women did not have the vote, had been campaigning for the vote, um, 
and were, did not therefore have full citizenship. So they were separate. You know, however, intellectually, ideologically, we might want to look for evidence of barriers breaking down. They were separate in a separate political category. So now I just want to look briefly at this uh, suffrage context for the war. So previous, or you know, we, we're all familiar with this, um, prior to the outbreak of war, the suffrage movement had been deploying language and indeed actions um, that we would associate with aggression with war. And uh, the Pankhurst in particular with the Women's Social and Political Union, the WSPU, which was the militant, more militant aspect, uh, wing of the suffrage societies, um, used military language. So, um, uh, Mrs. Pankhurst right? so I won't have any truce with the Prime Minister's so-called pledge. And when she's calling her members to take part in uh, militant action, she says to be militant in some way or other is a moral obligation. And if any woman refrains from militant protest against the injury done by the government and the House of Commons to women and to the race, she will share the responsibility for the crime. So it's, if you're not with us, you're against us. Submission under such circumstances will itself be a, a crime. So she's absolutely no hostages, um, very, very militant, aggressive language. And then, of course, we come to, just a few months later, Emily Wilding Davison's fatal accident, um, where she was, uh, we think she was trying to put a, the suffrage, no problem, we were trying to put the suffrage scarf around the king's horse so it would come in to the finish line with the flag, votes for women, round its neck, but that's not what she succeeded in doing. And uh, she was, of course, a student at this college, so that's, I think, why we particularly remember her. She was studying modern languages and literature. So when the war break out, broke out, what happened? Uh, there was a split within the suffrage movement, um, the Pankhursts and the women's, well, not Sylvia, but the other two, Women's Social and Political Union, uh, suspended the cam their campaign in order to support the war and to recruit, actively recruit women into war service, which they like the more um, peaceful, if you like, Fabian sort of wing uh, led by Millicent Fawcett, the NUWSS, the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies. Um, they too... Uh, saw that the war gave a big opportunity to women to change things, but they did not actively recruit women into war service, but they saw how they could use it politically for their own ends. So work, really, is the theme, I think, of the rest of my lecture. Um, work provides a catalyst for the suffrage, whether you are in the WSPU or the NU. WSS, whatever it's called, um, work is a way to change conditions for women. And Jessie Pope, of course, wrote War Girls, Simple Rhymes of Stirring Times, which Jessie Pope had not been in print, or her war poems had not been in print since the war until she appeared again in this, um, in this anthology. So and given that she is now such a well-known poet, really, uh, you can see this how the dissemination comes from this pioneering work in scars. But anyway, I wanted just um, you know, flagged up in red all the sort of aggressive words, and in blue over here I've got the sort of I've put the rather more hesitant words about oh, but we still have to be a bit feminine, um, just to get some of the energy of that. There's the girl who clips your ticket for the train and the girl who speeds the lift from floor to floor. There's the girl who does a milk round in the rain and the girl who calls for orders at your door. Strong, sensible and fit, they're out to show their grit and tackle jobs with energy and knack. No longer caged and penned up, they're going to keep their end up till the khaki soldier boys come marching back. So that's our refrain, till the khaki soldier boys come marching back. So Pope presents this as a brief reprieve. But the energy, the flair with which she describes the work, the kind of women's war, war work, is evident in, in the quality of the verse itself. Um, 
but she's not quite giving up on uh, there's a heart that's soft and warm, there's the mother, she's still not gone away, she'll come back. Um, so this was 1916, and Pope gets criticised a lot for being jingoistic and um, not thinking critically about the war. I think we have to look at her... I mean, she was a popular poet. She was one of the very few women in this anthology who earned their livings entirely through their pen. She was writing for the Daily Mail and the Daily Express. She was writing as much for the men in the trenches as she was writing for the audience at home. And she, she was just in tune with the popular mood. So she wasn't... And she needed to sell. You know, she needed to sell her poetry, and she just has this extraordinary capacity with rhythm and rhyme. Um, and I think we need to see her verse very much as a sort of verbal equivalent of the sort of posters that we'll see a, a few of earlier that, that are very sanitised, very clean, produce a, a, a very... They make a... You know, because their iconography is so clear, their lines are so clear, the pictures, the, the propaganda that they're trying to put across, absolutely unambiguous. And I think, really, that's where we have to put Pope. So women and work. Britain notices how social attitudes change as a result of women's war work. So again, same year as War Girls is published, um, Britain is going to visit her fiancé in August 1916, and she says, no one this time suggested going with me to London. Already the free and easy movements of girls, war workers, had begun to modify convention. So even in ordinary life, it was easier to move about. You didn't need a chaperone. So... The rest of my lecture now is going to be looking at the types of war work that women did, how that interacted with the ambition for suffrage, um, and then uh, to think how does poetry reflect this sort of experience and how does it evaluate this sort of experience, and then finally to consider poetry itself as a form of work um, and to think briefly about what sort of work poetry might be doing in culture. So the suffrage societies organised the Women's Right to Serve demonstration, a great procession on the 17th of July 1915. This was from the Illustrated London News. And uh, so you see this huge procession of women, many of them wearing their suffrage uh, clothes and carrying their suffrage banners um, and being watched near the houses, House of Commons. Um, this is what the note in the newspaper, in the Illustrated London News, this is what they wrote, the journalists wrote about it, said this whole demonstration, all classes, all professions, um, really united women to demand as a right that women should be allowed to take their share in munition and other war work. It's very selective, I think. And it was a success in every detail, except the weather, which was deplorable. So not much has changed. Um, then we get... I just this is this is not an exhaustive list. This is just uh, you know selected uh, the Women's Land Army certificate, which started being awarded from 1915 onwards, um, which is you know a beautiful crest here, and it was signed by the president of the Board of Trade and uh, the president of the Board of Agriculture. I think that is, um, and it said in this lovely copper plate writing. Every woman who helps in agriculture during the war is as truly serving her country as the man who is fighting in the trenches or on the sea. So this was a real effort to elevate um, women's agricultural work. In March 1917, we've whizzed on a couple of years, um, Millicent Fawcett, N-U-W-S-S, -S, uh, the more negotiating wing, of the suffrage societies thought that she could uh, that thought that she would have some leverage now there was sufficient change in government we had a new prime minister in 1916 um, and so sufficient change in political views towards women that she could now canvas opinion amongst many people in the country and many organizations and put reasons to the prime minister why women needed to to be given the vote. I think the key thing is in her capital letters, you know, to the right Honourable David Lloyd George, 
We, the undersigned, urge the, necess urge the necessity of enfranchising women in any proposed electoral reform brought forward during the war so that they shall take part in the election of the Parliament which will deal with the problems of reconstruction immediately after the war. Um, in the longer part of the letter, she writes, we hold women's suffrage to be a measure essential to the welfare of the country at this crisis. She thinks it's dangerous for a parliament not to represent women uh, to deal with the problems of industrial and social reconstruction which have to be considered after the war. So she's seeing how invested women are becoming in public life during the war, um, that they need to have their, that actually taken into government. She notes, this is these figures are confirmed by the Board of Trade just immediately after the war, um, that more than a million women have directly replaced men in industry. And she uses the military uh, vocabulary that a vast army of women wage earners. Um, and then she points out that there are thousands of households which are now unrepresented in the councils of their country because uh, upon them the lot has fallen to lose their men on the field of battle. So what do you do if you're head of house your husband is dead, you can't, you still can't vote, so what do you do? So she's got, she puts a very, very rational argument forwards, I think. Also in 1917, the Women's Army Auxiliary Corps was formed. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Um, and uh, we get a very neat, very neat picture of what's going on, nice uniforms, orderly cues, uh, lots of sort of sanitised images of... Um, women joining a sort of, not paramilitary, but it's serving, uh, helping the, the military operation. Stereotypes about what women are good at immediately uh, came into play. So the women go and help cooking, cooking in the camps in France. Women cooks immediately. We hear that they were both for the officers' mess and the men's more economical and better. And also women clerks picked up the work more quickly and the chauffeurs were equally satisfactory. Cleanliness, where there had been dirt, good cooking, where there had been indifferent, and economy, where there had been waste. So all the things that we know women are so good at suddenly came to play, into play in, in the battlefield or just behind the battlefield. Then we get this fantastic poster. I love this poster. More aeroplanes needed, also 1917. Um, and so young women ages between 18 and 35 were being invited to come and build some aeroplanes. And this is a sort of poster, the style I think is very like Jesse Pope's poetry. I think we can see the two together. Um, so we get this beautiful, beautiful, you know, khaki dressed woman, lovely hand signals and so on. Uh, and she's being invited or inviting other women to be trained in oxyacetylene welding aeroplane, woodwork, light fitting, core making, etc. So the Board of Trade, um, so the, sorry, the War Cabinet uh, reviewed after the war, they did a, a review of the um, work which women had done in, uh, during the war and the confirmed all these figures. So the, the women in, in employment went up from 6 million, just under 6 million, to nearly 7 and a third million. And I put in red there, I was very struck by the wording of this sentence. It says, this to the table, which I'm not giving you, which just listed all the stuff that women did and the numbers of women that were involved in which type of occupation. This table includes among the unoccupied those engaged in domestic work at home and other unpaid work except VAD nurses. And that's, for me, I was just bowled over by seeing domestic work being considered as other unpaid work, because I haven't been really uh, aware that domestic work, being a housekeeper, being a wife and a mother, was considered unpaid work until much more recently. Anyway, so they got their women's franchise at last. Um, in obviously earlier, before the war ended. And there, so there we have a St. Joan waving the flag of victory. So I, just because the um, suffragettes loved St. Joan, this is just for fun. I've got a couple of um, St. Jones that we had uh, earlier. So this here is the 1911 picture, Marjorie Annan Bryce. This was for the coronation procession. They women held a, and the suffragettes held a, 
a suffragette, a, a, a women's coronation procession a week before uh, King George was crowned in 1911. And here we've got Bryce dressed up as St. Joan with Robin Hood leading her white horse. And this one on this side is um, a suffragette called Elsie Howie in April 1909. Um, this was a suffragette parade arranged to organise the, the, the celebrate the prison release of Emmeline Pethwick Lawrence. So we get there, we've got the Representation of the People Act, 1918. Um, women over the age of 30 who had a property were qualified to vote. And that was 40% of the women in the UK at the time. So 10 years later, the franchise was lowered to those under 21. So what do the women say? What do the poets say about this trajectory, this sort of sample of work? So... I've just here I've just picked out a quotation by a woman called Nosheen Khan, who published one of the earliest books on women's poetry of the First World War in the 80s. Um, and she says, the verse which documents women's experience of the war at home described the liberating social change heralded in women's life by war, the particular nature of their war work, and the sights and sounds of war as they impinged upon their consciousness. Authentic writing comes out of the recording of the home scenes. Inspiration draws upon lived experience. And a recurrent realisation which emerges is that women were not unfeeling and incomprehending, but open and sensitive to the brutal, futile nature of war. I think there are quite a lot of assumptions Khan's making there, but I won't go into them at the moment. Um, she also returns us to Jessie Pope's War Girls, she says, the new incarnations of women in wartime, each type of woman taking on duties essential to the smooth functioning of the motherland, whilst not entirely forgetting or foregoing the traditional female occupations of ministering angel and knitter, form the subject of Jessie Pope's War Girls. So, but there is some debate, even amongst the women poets or the feminists or the activists of the period, about the extent to which poetry that was written in the period was actually voicing something new and the extent to which women were so trapped within uh, what patriarchy, if you like, had created of them that actually they couldn't speak independently. So we've got Alice Maynell versus Helen Swanick. Swanick was um, uh, a pacifist suffrage campaigner. So Maynell argues new roles, well, new roles... Um, shape new attitudes and poetic personae. Alice Maynell phrases it, new duties have set women thinking of themselves not only as daughters of women, but as daughters of men. Um, the war triggered women's powerful witness, social critique, anger and laments in the years following 1914. That's summarised by Margaret Higginay, who's an important critic of the poetry of this period. Um, Nosheen Khan picks out, however, Helen Swanick's set statement, which I find very interesting. Women were so far from free, legally, socially, economically and politically, that it would be absurd to expect them to be authentic, authentically womanly, to stand on their feet and think womanly thoughts. They still, in the mass, thought a weak version of men's thoughts. So Swanick is saying, there, you know, women are going to take a long time to find their identities. Um, what do the poets say about this great list? So I've listed a few things. So just to recap and to think about what the women in um, Scars Upon My Heart say. I'm not going to go into everyone in detail. Uh, but on the question of... We started with the Women's Right to Serve demonstration in 1915. And I guess the most uh, extreme statement in... Scars Upon My Heart of Women's Right to Serve is Cicely Hamilton's poem Non-Combatant, um, which she published in 1916 in an anthology called Poems of the Great War. This is one of the... The, the fact that it was called a great war within three months of it breaking out was one of the things that I found astonishing on, on starting to work on it, actually. So one of the things that... or there are a number of things that to note about this poem, but... Um, she was not. She, she was a member of the WSPU, and she, so she was in the militant wing of the suffrage society. And she was not herself, I think, an, uh, an active suffragette. 
Um, so she used language, words, poetry, song as her weapon. Um, she wrote the words to the suffragette anthem, uh, the March of the Women, which was sung in prisons often when, in Holloway Prison, for example, we've got reports of the suffragettes walking round the exercise yard singing this song or singing it in their cells. She uh, w was a dramatist um, later after the war. She worked a lot with theatre. And in fact, in 1924, she wrote a play called Non-Competent, uh, which I haven't read, so I can't tell you anything about it. Um, uh, but I would like to read it. And one of the things that strikes me about the language in which she writes here is the way in which she says, you know, I've already been attacked by my society. I'm already, uh, you know, so she writes from the suffragette point of view. You know, before one drop of angry blood was shed, I was sore hurt and beaten to my knee. So I'm a woman. I've been attacked before this war started. And she anatomizes the woman. She talks about, I'm a, an idle, useless mouth. So she takes the woman's body apart, and I think it's very interesting that she picks the organ of the mouth, because, of course, that was um, uh, with the force feeding in the, in the prisons. That was, of course, the organ that, you know, was they, the women refused to use, and the doctors then bypassed, or the medical profession bypassed in the force feeding. So there's, I'm wondering whether there's a, an echo of that suffragette experience coming through in this poem. But the, the anthology itself is absolutely full of women writing about their war service experience. Um, most of them in positive ways, uh, but the one that stands out as somebody who clearly thinks women should not be building weapons, uh, women at munition making, is Collins, who notes of these women who are building bombs that in fact their hands should be ministering unto the flame of life. They should be mothers. They should be at home nurturing their children and not building bombs instead. Okay, Women's Land Army was the next place I went to. Uh, Rose McCauley served one of the, her first war jobs was in the Women's Land Army. And one can read Picnic, July 1917, as, as coming out of that experience of very close connection with the land. So... Fawcett's argument that women need to, Lloyd George, that um, women needed to be given the vote during the war so that they could be part of the reconstruction, uh, meaningful debates about reconstruction after the war, is of course problematised by the poets, um, and in particular Margaret Postgate Cole, her nephew, gave us Bagpuss and the Clangers, and died last week, I think. In afterwards, uh, she, she, she thinks about how difficult it's going to be after this war. How can there be reconstruction? What is reconstruction? And, I mean, many, many, many poets of this anthology address that problem. Um, and it just, it's obviously a very emotional, very difficult problem. What does reconstruction mean? So... In terms of the WAAC, the wax, um, we've got Dirk's poem after Boulogne Wood, and this always makes me laugh. The scene is um, uh, a couple on leave. Uh, well, the man is on leave, he's back from the front, and the woman is obviously serving in the whack. And he says, so what do you do? What have you been doing while I've been um, at the front? And she says, oh, I go to bed, I said, at half past ten, and lead the life of any simple whack. And I love the, the sort of main thing that she says is, well... I become unconscious, you know, there is no life that I, I don't have a life, I just sleep, I'm sleepwalking through my life. So the first thing she answers is to that question is I go to bed. So, you know, the whack maybe wasn't such a great thing for the women who were in it. Then we have the poster about building planes, which made it all look so sunny and wonderful. And of course, practically the first poem you, you read when you open this anthology is by Alan, called The Raiders, and it's a poem about how the planes carry with them stings of death. So I think when you overlay the connotations of death that come with the aeroplanes, that the women are so jollily, sunnily being asked to build, 
uh, you get a very, very different picture from what the poster was actually trying to tell us. So even in writing perhaps more factual, experiential poetry about their war work, the poets are already evaluating and making more complicated this kind of war work. Um, so in sort of the last movement of this lecture, uh, I, I just want to take the Women's Land Army as a springboard to large, considering larger metaphors of land and harvest as they're represented in these poems and perhaps in some poems um, beyond the, uh, this anthology. So three sections to this, women and the land create a, an image of the motherland, the nation is gendered female. Uh, we also get a sense of nature itself being nationalised and in some of these poems the Englishness of place names, there's a sense of ownership about pastoral rural England that comes to the fore, that the flora and the fauna, the lark, the blackbird, the apple, the elm, um, are become very English. And so there's this merging of the woman, the land, national identity. And then, of course, the other kind of harvest that comes from war is, is death and the way the earth seeps in the blood of the fallen. Um, so those are the three sort of general ideas of this, the sort of more, if you like, the more complex kind of work that poetry might be doing other than just representing, other than just representing uh, experience. So without going into all of these details, um, we have poets not represented, well, represented but not with these particular poems, very, very typically addressing the land, England, as motherland. So we get Margaret Woods, England, mother of liberty. Nisbet in a, writes, England, our mother, our mistress, and our queen. And Lillian Anderson, who is in the collection, here was his England, child sweet and maiden gentle. So England is infantilised and turned into a maiden. Obviously, just waiting for his return. Other poets, Lawrence Binion, also, you know, enkindled this dear earth that bore us. Um, Anderson's poem, Their Leave in 1917, also particularly uh, brings together Englishness with descriptions of the pastoral landscape and suggests an ownership of English ownership of nature. Jean Cameron, W.J. Cameron, The Women in Wartime, Cameron's not in this anthology. She was not even counted as a woman war poet um, because she always published under the name W.J. Cameron. And I found her because she is a graduate of this college. She was, is, is an alumni and she read um, German and music here from 93 to 96, 1893 to 96. Um, so that's how I came across her work. She creates in the first, she writes a, a short book, a short collection of poems, War and Life in 1916, which she writes a poem called The Women in Wartime, um, where she very much pictures the land and the, and the women as one, but they are left behind, and the men go away, and the women and the land are there to serve the men. So she perpetuates, she's quite conservative, she perpetuates the idea of these separate spheres. A different view of the land, rather than being nurturing there to serve men, is, of course, the pacifist view. Uh, Margaret Sackville's work is represented in this anthology, uh, but not these two poems, which I've selected here, Nostra Culpa and Quo Vaditis. Um, but they, yeah, they're from the pageant of war, which the poems in here are also from. And she attacks her fellow women, you know, our hands prepared these blood-drenched, dreadful lands, and we are mothers, and we're also murderers of mankind. So she is, she's saying mothers, women are responsible for disseminating this toxic ideology. We're leading our men to the slaughter, and we are their murderers. Um, and so the land just simply takes up the blood of the slaughtered. And in Quo Vaditis, she imagines the ghosts of two soldiers from different sides encountering each other un in, 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 in the afterlife 
And they say, same light, same doom, and to what purpose? Deep we lie in the same womb, the slain, the slain together in one sleep. So there she literally says the earth is a womb. So she literally thinks of the, creates the earth into a mother. Different kinds of uh, other approaches to pacifism, slight detour. Um, Gertrude Ford, she, both of these poems are both the 10th Armistice Day and a fight to the finish are represented in um, this anthology. And I think Claire Buck has just simply, she in Reframing Women's War Poetry, she simply sets the context in which Ford wrote this, these poems um, and points out that the Hague Women's International Peace Conference took place in 1915 um, in the face of systematic opposition. So uh, women were, were campaigning for peace, but I think there are lots of reasons, you know, we would question now, there are lots of reasons why one might be a pacifist that don't involve having to say, but I'm a mother. You know, so it's this sort of gendered biological argument for pacifism that I think today women, feminist or not, would have a problem with. Um, but in, in, in the late, through from the late 19th century into this period, it was a legitimate argument move. Most of the poems published in this anthology and elsewhere by women during this period are elegies. Um, and they, so they're grieving, they're mourning, um, they are attempting to make good or come to terms with death. Um, and I think Claire Buck here, this sort of second paragraph, uh, I think makes the most interesting comment about how women's war elegy works. Um, she writes, women's war elegy stages the feminine and domestic space of the home as the heart of the nation. Rather than as a private space, making female poetic mourning an important ideological component for the nation at war. Women's mourning converts the soldiers' violent actions on behalf of the state into pure and sacred sacrifice by the private individual for the nation. So you start to see the kind of work that women's poetry is doing uh, women's poetry as national work. Again, Claire Buck identifies two particular poems in this anthology as doing that kind of work, making good bereavement. So she looks at To Tony, Age 3, which is the last poem in the collection, and Eleanor Fargin's absolutely superb sonnet, Easter Monday. I think really that's where I'm going to finish. We've got Lawrence Cottrell, who introduced um, Riley's biography, the bibliography, uh, he says the value of collecting all of this war poetry is that it helps with the memorialising. And uh, quite clearly, women are a very, very important uh, contributor to that memorialising. So that's where I'm going to finish. So thank you very much. Thank you.